Melissa, and welcome everyone. Um, in case it wasn't clear, you can also tweet your uh, questions using the hashtag um, BD Outsource. Okay, I'm so glad so many people could join us today. I think we have an interesting program. When we think about the whole realm of challenges associated with managing content that arrives in libraries and archives in born digital form, we realize that the real challenge is keeping up with the flood of information that's arriving now, today's archives, and preparing for all the forms that will be coming in in the future. It really makes sense to focus our efforts on getting up to speed on the current flood and the future flood, and doing so really requires that we take a really rational look at the accumulated media of the past. The, um, the, the long tail of, of obscure media is indeed long, but it's also very thin, and we shouldn't expect that every archives can handle every type of obscure media. It's important to know that you're not alone in having media that is problematic. There are many archives that hold born digital content but lack the equipment or the expertise to transfer that content for processing, preservation, and access. Today's speakers are going to help you think about the ways to move forward with old media and old formats that you may have in your collection. And what we're focusing on is what to do when you have something that you cannot read in-house. Our speakers have faced these challenges and come up with pretty innovative solutions. They're going to help us to begin thinking in community terms. Who can you reach out to for expertise, advice, and service? The speakers will each speak for about five minutes apiece, one after the other, and then we'll take questions at the end. Let's begin with Linda schmitz purich from the Smithsonian Institution Archives. Thank you, Ricky, and good afternoon, everyone. To start off today, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of some different media and some approaches. First of all, our best practices at the Smithsonian Archives are to ingest the materials as soon as possible, if possible. We need to consider what the media is. Do we have the equipment or just somebody else? What type of condition is the media in? What do we think might be on the media? Our collections have DVDs, CDs, thumb drives, external hard drives, zip disks, uh, floppy disks, and diskettes, and less common types these days, such as digital audio tapes. We also have a Windows XP environment and a Mac OS 9 machine as well, off network to access some of these older diskettes. Some of our success stories have included DATs, digital audio tapes which had had their heyday in the 1990s, but never really took off with the consumer public despite their high quality. Stats are obsolete, the machines are no longer made, and few people know how to fix them anymore. We have more than 2,000 of these in our collections. In 2010, the Smithsonian Folkways record label was kind enough to lend us a DAT player, and we were able to start an in-house pilot to begin the transfer. There are some cases where immediate ingest is not possible as well. Four millimeter and eight millimeter data tapes contain some of the Smithsonian's earliest websites from 1994 to 1995. Even when the accession came to the archives in 1998, it was documented that there were problems with retrieving the contents. We revisited the collection in 2012, and National Archives was able to tell us that the tapes did have files and referred us to an outside vendor who was able to recover data off three of the four tapes. We also see older media that is unfamiliar. This year, the Smithsonian Libraries approached us with a Smithsonian CDI, or CD Interactive, a Phillips proprietary product from 1991 that worked with a special interactive player. I had not seen one of these before. I was able to retrieve a listing of contents, but was not able to get playback of any of the files. There are emulators, but we did not go down that path since the patron was not interested in it at that point. 
This year also brought in some D2 tapes that contain digital video. We already have some of these from prior years, but lack the equipment for them at this time, but there are outside vendors who do. And finally, I think we all see the writing on the wall regarding CDs and DVDs as streaming and cloud storage push forward. Nevertheless, there are a lot of these out there, and we should not be sitting on them. Not only is there the issue of optical drives not being installed in many computers now, but there's also the problem of the lifespan of CDs and DVDs themselves. Research by the Library of Congress, which has received good press coverage this year, and other organizations has shown that the lifespans can vary greatly, even when they are manufactured at the same time. There are also issues of improper storage, handling, management, and those awful adhesive labels, and I've even seen masking tape used as well. So if you have them, get the contents off as soon as possible. So it comes down to this, some questions to consider. What do you have? Have you done an inventory? Do you know what it is? The Museum of Obsolete Media has a very useful site um, at obsoletemedia.org. It has pictures that will list video carriers, audio carriers, and other types of electronic media. Um, if it's not possible to immediately retrieve something, consider how soon the material might be requested. Is there a vendor that you can send it to? Is there a researcher who's willing to pay for the retrieval of the data? Are there other archives or organizations that have equipment that they are willing to loan? Is there equipment that you could buy? Good places to look, schools, eBay, Craigslist, listservs. We actually were able to buy DAP players last year when NPR was moving to its new headquarters. And then, are the materials held anywhere else? Are there dedicated groups to the type of media, especially when it comes to old interactive or games? So consider all, all your options, some that might be creative, and it might even include waiting until some better access mechanisms appear or are developed, and above all, avoid harming the media. Thank you. Great. Hi. Um, I'm Marima Adelod, and currently I am Special Assistant to the Director of Preservation over at the Library of Congress. I've actually had a job change since this presentation came up. But before this position, for several years, I was Project Manager over, let's see, here we go. I was Project Manager for the Tangible Media Project, an initiative based out of Library Services Technology Policy Directorate over at the Library of Congress. So a few years ago, I was given a charge. Looking at obsolete tangible media formats in the library's collections, begin to explore what we could do with current library staff, hardware, and software. And from there, develop workflows that could be used on a variety of materials performed by all staff, by multiple curatorial divisions, done in-house, and result in a backup copy of the items stored on long-term storage. So why do we care about the workflows being applicable across multiple divisions? Because it allows us to support more staff and encourages standard practices and process. And why is in-house important? Because contracts take time, and when possible, it's worthwhile to put some effort into increasing staff digital competencies. Great, so what do you need to do all of this? Well, focus, hardware and software surveys, some initial workflows, and support to and from staff. So after doing a survey of 17 Library of Congress curatorial divisions, we decided to start with floppy disks. As you can see, the vast majority in our collections are three and a half inch, but we do have a substantial number of five and a quarters as well. More exotic types like 8-inch, 3-inch, and Bernoulli show up, but not in large numbers and not widely across divisions. So, as you all know, the first step in reading a floppy disk is having a drive for it. One advantage of having older staff machines at Library of Congress is that most of ours have 3.5-inch floppy drives standard. We were also able to find some working PCs with 5 and a quarter inch drives, 
And once word got out that we were looking, colleagues from another part of the organization offered some portable five and a quarter inch drives. As for the other disk types, we haven't been able to find drives in house. So in regards to this effort, we set them aside. We next survey staff about the software they were using and settled upon Windows XCopy command line and FTK Imager as the initial tools to explore. While not the easiest for a novice to use, they were already on our computers in-house and were most likely to be able to provide complete, unchanged copies of the data. Workflows have been a work in progress. Staff wanted to be sure that they were getting all the files off of the disks, including hidden files, and that new system dates weren't assigned to files as the new copy was created. So we showed them the workflow steps that addressed those issues and offered additional documentation steps they could do. Some staff were concerned about disks being overwritten during copying, so we reminded them of the tab that makes floppy read-only. After reading data off the disks, all the workflows included steps to create checksums and other files using the Bagot spec, and for items to be inventoried in our content transfer services system as they're saved to long-term safe storage. As for documentation, recognizing that many staff work best with directions they have a part in creating, I included brief instructions that highlighted every step they absolutely must do. But understanding that other staff want step-by-step -step details with pictures I created detailed instructions that showed each action in exhaustive detail. So writing the basic workflows was just the beginning. I'd schedule initial meetings with staff to discuss their materials and the kind of time they could devote to the project. From there, I'd schedule the staff some time with the equipment and with them go over the instructions step by step to understand what steps, based on their needs, should be expanded, added or excluded. I'd usually sit with them for the first couple of times with the equipment, making revisions to the instructions, and then afterwards be available as needed for technical support. After those initial meetings, they were usually more than happy to be on their own. We'd talk of when they hit technical snags or if I'd updates to the instruction based on software updates or hardware availability. So the measurable results of all of this I worked directly with and created specialized instructions for two of the five curatorial divisions with five and a quarter inch floppies. Dozens of floppies have been transferred and saved to long-term storage, and staff who hadn't been involved with this kind of work developed some new expertise that's led them in new career directions. These divisions had been contemplating transferring data off these media but were unsure how to start, and this project gave them some help and confidence to get going. But the work has impact even for the three of five divisions who already had workflows in place or others who don't have any floppy disks. By making the workflows freely, freely available on the library's internet site, we communicated current practice and delivered a springboard others could use to adapt or create their own workflows. So next steps. The Library of Congress's Preservation Reformatting Division has been gathering equipment in a lab that will be available to all Library of Congress curatorial divisions. Currently, it has scanners, portable drives, and a FRED machine, but division staff are working across the Library of Congress to determine what other hardware and software it should include. At least one library committee is gathering workflows for processing floppies and other formats, looking for common problems, problems and solutions that could be used across the organization. And another group here is tasked with developing scalable ways of processing materials that we can't process in-house. Uh, hi, I'm Elise Warshavsky. I'm the digital archivist at the Presbyterian Historical Society. I was hired just over two years ago to, be the, to start the digital archivist program here at the Presbyterian Historical Society. In its role as the National Archives of the Presbyterian Church, um, we care for letters, communications, and other documents from missionaries, grassroots activities, and other members of the church. These help to document the political and social history of the church. Um, oh. 
Clifton Kirkpatrick served as the stated clerk for the PCUSA in 1996 to 2008. The stated clerk is the highest elected official within the church. Needless to say, we were interested in his records and correspondence. The records manager, previous to my hiring, gained possession of the laptop containing the files he had worked on, as well as his email. Presbyterian Church knew they were going to have to start emailing archive, uh, electronic files, but didn't implement any program until I was hired in 2012. On my first week at the job, I was handed, handed the stated clerk's laptop and told to archive it. I was also given detailed instructions regarding passwords, the types of files I would find, and more specifically, the numbers of emails that existed within the Nobel GroupWise email account as well as the suggestion to save each of the 28,000 emails individually as Word documents and possibly print them out. <laughs> Upon further investigation, I found that these emails were thoroughly appraised by the records manager, a practice that's just not realistic in most people's electronic workflows. She had converted uh, the account to a remote account, taking the emails off the server as the church switched from Novell to Microsoft Outlook in 2007. This enabled the emails to live solely on the laptop that I had on my desk. The records archivist had also appraised each individual email, moving the incoming into the inbox and moving the out, leaving the outgoing into the sent. This appraisal process may work for paper records, but was very, is very unrealistic in electronic form. We had lost fo folder structure and possibly other valuable information. Uh, the emails are readable, but only on this laptop. Uh, the records have a 50-year embargo on them, so nobody's able to access them for at least another 50 years. Um, I could image the laptop, but my institution is working with limited IT resources now, and my position at the time was only guaranteed for five years. So I needed to ensure that these files would be readable in 50 years by anyone that worked in my organization. I wanted to convert out of the Novell GroupWise to Microsoft Outlook PST file or a more archival inbox. I tried many available tools, but none of them seemed to work. It seems that most existing tools were meant to work with a live Novell GroupWise account and not a remote account like I was dealing with. I felt trapped. I felt like I failed at my first task as digital archivist. I finally placed a phone call to the company that makes a commercial grade email converter called Transin Converter. I explained to them what I was trying to accomplish and that this was a one-time situation. They agreed for the cost that they usually charge for a single mailbox conversion that they would resurrect my remote account on their Novell GroupWise servers and then convert it to an Outlook PST for me. Once the files were converted to PST, I was able to move forward with the migration plan that I had spec'd out. PST to a more archival email format inbox, as well as run a batch tool to export the PDFs from the Outlook account of each individual email and convert them to PDFAs, a format I felt confident my colleagues would be able to search and access in 15 years. Archiving this data was both exciting and frustrating for me. While I was thrilled to work with such a unique data conversion, it was also frustrating to feel that I didn't have the tools for skills necessary to complete one of my first jobs. When I finally reached out to Transin, it helped me with the conversion and I learned a valuable lesson. Sometimes there's no need to develop resources in-house, especially if it's a unique and most likely not repeatable incident. Get help, move on, in doing what you know how to do. Accession, appraise, and preserve. Ted, are you ready?
It looks like there's a problem with Ted's audio, Ricky. I'm wondering if we can um, skip to the next presenter and then come back to Ted afterwards. Okay, um, sure. Ben, are you ready? There we go. Take it away, Ben. All right. Hi, I'm Ben Goldman, digital archivist at Penn State University. Um, this is a pretty involved project. I'll try to condense it down in the interest of time, but if you want to know more, I do have a, um, a link you can go to here, and also feel free to contact me uh, after the presentation, after the webinar. So our project began when we discovered 27 of these in the uh, collection of a modern um, literary author. These are 27, there were 27 of these three-inch discs. Uh, we weren't sure that the discs were readable or even contained data worth recovering. Uh, most of what we knew about the discs really came from the labels, and you can see that the, the handwriting on the labels isn't always very helpful. Uh, we certainly didn't have the equipment needed to read the discs. We knew that from the start. Uh, I would note that these are three-inch discs, not three-and-a-half-inch, which many of you are probably familiar with. And we weren't even sure at the outset uh, what kind of hardware was needed to read these discs. Though the author did confirm over email to us that she at one point owned an Amstrad computer. So Amstrad was a somewhat popular model of computer in the United Kingdom for a brief period uh, in the 1980s and early 90s, primarily used for word processing and um, not, didn't really have much of a market share here in the States, which is why I, I think many uh, repositories probably haven't seen one of these or seen disks like these. It was certainly unexpected to us. We briefly considered trying to acquire one of these machines and, and stand up the hardware in order to read the disks, but uh, ultimately decided against that, thinking we didn't really have the resources to accomplish that effectively. So what we did instead was decided to jump into uh, the OCLC project that was starting at the time. This was a project to explore the, the procedures and um, resources necessary to outsource recovery of data from obsolete media. So it, very early in the project, they had determined, uh, working with some vendors, that there would be a cost of about $40 per disk. And so we were able to uh, quickly secure funding from an internal libraries grant that would help us pay for this. And our intent in joining the project was that we wanted to model the developing vendor agreement to start. We really wanted to make it an extension of our uh, developing internal born digital workflow. So one common step that a lot of repositories have is to do some media inventorying at the outset of their work. And we had a spreadsheet that we wanted to use uh, with vendors that could be used to identify the disks, their labels, the contents, uh, establish a naming convention that the vendors could then use to apply to any disk images produced from the disks. Uh, and we wanted them to also you know, take some fixity uh, steps at, at the moment that they were able to recover data and document that within this spreadsheet. Mostly, we wanted to see if outsourcing would be a viable option for archivists confronting elusive computer media formats. Could we meet core archival requirements? Could we transpose our emerging best practices onto this process? And I also wanted to figure out whether I thought $40 per disk was really a, a viable cost model for us. So um, looks like my formatting is a little off. I apologize. Um, many months later, uh, the results were pretty interesting. We had ended up working with three vendors in total, and we actually didn't have an agreement for various reasons, uh, the OCLC uh, draft vendor agreement with any of them. Uh, the first vendor we worked with was the Museum of Computer Culture, and they quickly realized they didn't have the equipment needed to read the disks and that it wasn't really cost effective for them to acquire it, which made perfect sense to me. Uh, they referred us to a computer museum in the United Kingdom and this computer museum spent many months trying to get various uh, Amstrad machines working, replacing parts, trying to figure out exactly what model of Amstrad machine the disks would read on, ultimately unsuccessfully, and himself had to outsource to a computer enthusiast in Cornwall. So uh, this is where I think the, um, the absence of a signed agreement might have limited us some. We, ended up acquiring disk images that, and, that were native to the Amstrad operating system. 
And so once I received these, I realized that it wasn't really easy to migrate them to more modern formats, and I couldn't process them using common forensic tools. Here at Penn State, we use FTK Imager and BitCurator. Instead, um, what we needed in order to get the actual content from the disks were migrated versions of the data. And so the vendor also provided us three versions of every file in three different formats, each with its own brand of lossiness. Um, this was, again, a, a step that we didn't really have um, much of a, of a say in. Uh, we also didn't have any adherence to naming conventions, so the first batch of files that we received back, we weren't sure which data it derived or which disks the data derived from. So there was a, a slight hiccup there as we had to figure out uh, what content we were actually looking at. And we didn't really get to apply any of the typical fixity checks and fixity um, steps that we have uh, in our emerging born digital workflows until we got the data back and, and inserted it into our workflow here. So despite all of this, um, despite it not really meeting uh, fully our expectations going in, I wouldn't call this project a failure. Uh, the first thing I think I've learned in my time as a digital archivist is that you have to have a high tolerance for ambiguity and for uh, fugitive media and digital objects in general that can be very defiant to the kind of workflows and to uh, the kind of solutions we sometimes want to apply as archivists. Uh, so we, as I said, we have to tolerate a certain amount of that. Uh, I think communication is really key when working with vendors to outsource, and I would suggest that anyone, any repository who considers this step uh, in the future should really key in on that vendor agreement and uh, use that as a foundation for their project. It really sets expectations around communication, I think. Uh, and I'm not sure the cost model we worked with will be sustainable, although someone, um, after we presented this at SAA, mentioned that maybe $40 per disk doesn't actually differ too much from the cost of having a staff member process the disks locally, and I think we could use a little bit more research and uh, examination of that. I guess this leads me to my final conclusion that I think archivists could actually do better to develop some in-network solutions. So we do have some collaborative services in place in our profession, in the libraries generally. We have technology, we have resources, we have talented archivists working on these issues. And I think it would be nice to see some better community strategies for tackling them. Um, and I think OCLC, with some of their work they've done to explore outsourcing as an option, has been starting to initiate those dialogues. And I will turn it over now. Well, speaking of staying in network, um, we have an uh, interesting uh, talk coming up from Matthew McKinley on that very topic. So, Matthew, if you go next, and then we'll um, circle back and get Ted when he's back online. Matthew. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Matthew McKinley from the University of California, Irvine. And uh, I'm in the IT department as a digital project specialist, but I'm trained as an archivist. So. I'll be covering sort of the perspective of providing a migration service as an archive to an archive. So the material that I'm working with was um, 15 five and a quarter inch floppy disks from the Southern California Women for Understanding group. It's one of the earliest lesbian nonprofit educational organizations and it's based out of Los Angeles. Their materials are stored at the Mazer Lesbian Archives within the UC LA Special Collections. Uh, the inventory says the disk contains mailing lists and research data and other errata, um, and probably some pretty interesting stuff if I can actually get to it. So I haven't actually received or imaged the media yet, um, which sort of brings me to my first larger takeaway, uh, which is know the hoops before you jump. Uh, the main reason I still haven't performed this work is that the legal department and other administrators from both UC Irvine and UCLA need to sign off on the service agreement. Um, we've had our legal department look at it, which took a, a good long while, and now an assistant university librarian at UCLA is on her third pass of the document. So it's taking a long time, a lot longer than we thought it would. Um, if you do have a vendor agreement or a workflow for converting other media like audiovisual media or you know anything other than the digital media we're working with here, you're kind of ahead of the game because you probably know the logistical and legal and administrative hoops you need to jump through. If you don't, it's good to ask around to see what roadblocks others ran into um, facing similar sorts of uh, outsourcing relationships and agreements. R remember, this is an innovative service, so your administration may not understand or agree with what you're doing, 
but sometimes you can kind of use that to your advantage by making it known that the data on the disk could be dying and that time is of the essence to really capture what's on there. My next takeaway is that the knowledge level really affects the level of collaboration, the level of oversight, and what sort of communication style is needed. It depends upon the nature of both institutions, the ones providing the media and the ones providing the actual migration work. Uh, we were both archivists within our archive setting, and so we were familiar with archival terms and concepts. Um, whereas your service provider might not be, it may be a, te a technical group without a preservation or a library and archive focus. So you need to make it clear exactly what your group needs in both the agreement and an ongoing communication. Make sure you list things like, as others have covered here, like metadata requirements, file format specifications, privacy and security concerns, and make sure they really understand what you're talking about and, and sort of the way you're coming at it. Don't be afraid to explain concepts and uh, make sure they, that they understand this could save you a lot of time and headaches later. My final takeaway is that context is everything. Uh, and this is something I've learned from doing other disk migration and, and content migration work is that anything you can learn about when and how the media was created is important both for provenance metadata, but even more important for trying to access or convert the media and content. As you can see from this graphic, there were a lot of different word processors before words sort of came along and, and more or less took over in the mid-90s um, and, and similar programs. So what, what you get really depends on the creator's knowledge or interest level. Some may be able to give you detailed version numbers uh, or lots of information, and some may just say, I used whatever came on my Mac in 1985. Whatever you get is better than nothing. It, it helps you f reconstruct sort of both their work environment and the ways to get at the files that they're giving you. Uh, the AIMS white paper, uh, which was published in 2011, has a great donor survey template that gives you a lot of questions you can ask of creators to sort of get at this information. It covers both computing behavior as well as the hardware and software they may use. Um, Finally, if you do find software on the media while you're imaging, it's best to record the name and version number and sort of track it or make note of it somewhere, because it's fairly likely you may need it to access these files or possibly other files you find down the line. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to Margo. To Margo. There we go. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Margot Padilla, and I'm the Strategic Programs Manager at the Metropolitan New York Library Council, or METRO. Uh, I'm here to speak briefly on the Born Digital Migration Service pilot project being coordinated by METRO and the Center for uh, Jewish History with support from the Delmas Foundation. In 2012, Ricky Irway's OCLC report, Swatting the Long Tail of Digital Media, a Call for Collaboration, proposed a community-based approach for transferring content off of leg legacy media to more stable media. It suggested that a local, a local institution become a hub and develop the expertise and acquire and maintain the necessary equipment to provide transfer services for small or medium-sized institutions without the staff or resources to undertake this sort of work for themselves, but who have content and digital, on digital storage media. Metro and the Center for Jewish History are coordinating a library and archives working group to test this approach. The group is focused on the practical logistical issues and outcomes involved with this process to test and refine real world workflows, contractual agreements and deliverables, and to document all steps for publication and for use by the larger archives community. Partners in the working group include the American Jewish Historical Society, the Guggenheim Museum Archives, the Leo Beck Institute, the New York Historical Society, and Queens Library. As part of the pilot, each organization will explore their own internal institutional processes and requirements for inventorying these types of materials, appraising and selecting them for transfer, and determining how to reintegrate materials into their collections after being transferred off of legacy media. So far, each participant has conducted a full or partial survey of their born digital or digitized materials on digital storage media with the goal of identifying appropriate materials for inclusion in this pilot. A small sample of test materials have been selected and delivered to Metro, and so far we have received floppies, zip disks, and optical media from working group members. As a nonprofit consortium currently providing a range of other digital services, Metro is already well situated to offer digital migration services on a free or cost recovery basis to local repositories. 
This pilot project will help establish the feasibility of a broader implementation. From Metro's side, we are focused on scoping and developing our service model. We are closely tracking cost and labor estimates for developing a collaborative forensics, migration, and media archaeology lab and providing transfer-related services such as metadata, content analysis, normalization, and redundant storage. We will also be identifying and refining other potential requirements such as insurance coverage while items are in transit, secure storage areas for items held at Metro, delivery methods such as FTP or external hard drives, and protocols for dealing with any confidential data or personally identifiable information. The group has developed a draft service agreement, taking into consideration questions of potential deliverables, security, turnaround times, and other standard agreement language. A great resource for putting something like that together is the OCLC report by Ricky, Ben, and Matthew titled Agreement Elements for Outsourcing Transfer of Born Digital Content. Metro is currently in the process of using a dedicated workstation, workstation to transfer content off legacy media. There will be an iterative process to determine deliverables and develop a tiered service model. We will be providing a basic service level to start, which will be a disk image with file system analytics and reporting and a metadata export. Each organization will then analyze this initial information and let Metro know what sort of additional forensic processing or analysis they would be interested in receiving, and then Metro will sort, sort these requests out into tiers with different turnaround times and potential associated costs. I'll add that we are also developing procedures for giving our members access to the workstation and allowing them to transfer content on their own, and we are also considering making certain components mobile for use on-site at member institutions. Discussions about expectations and scope of work, contact, contract agreements, workflows, and deliverables are ongoing. You will be able to follow our work as we begin releasing our preliminary findings, which will be available on the Metro website. For more information about this working group, you can contact me or you can email Kevin Schlotman, Archival Services Manager at the Center for Jewish History. Thanks very much. Thanks, Margo. So we've heard a couple of in-network solutions. Matthew told us about one archive providing a service to another archive. Margo told us about uh, within a consortium having a central sort of service uh, bureau Okay, service provider. And now we'll hear from Ted Hall from the National Archives about um, sister government agencies helping each other out. Ted? All right. Thank you, Ricky. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Very good. Thank you. Um, I want to apologize for the technological um, glitch that I had earlier, and, and uh, thank you for your patience. So, um, yes, my name is Ted Hull. I'm director of the Electronic Records Division at the National Archives. Um, and I appreciate being included in today's discussion. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a small project that we had in 2013 that related to the recovery of data from an obsolete uh, magnetic tape format called, uh, that's referred to as seven track tapes. Um, and little bit about our program in case you're not familiar with it uh, at the National Archives. Um, the National Archives has had a program uh, for born digital electronic records for over 40 years. Um, the current incarnation is the Electronic Records Division that has uh, custodial responsibility for born digital federal records that have been appraised for and scheduled for permanent retention in the National Archives. We currently have about 17 permanent staff that have responsibilities for accessioning, processing, arranging for preservation, describing, and providing access to our vast holdings. <clears throat> our current holdings measure uh, some 932 series from over 100 federal agencies, and the volumes are increasing every day. Uh, so in, uh, we started a project back in 2009 to migrate our holdings from a previous tape-based paradigm using our, uh, our um, archival preservation system that, that preserve records on tape to a new paradigm where we're preserving records in what's referred to as the electronic records archives. Uh, many of you have probably heard of that. So in the process of migrating our holdings, 
we identified a small set of seven track tapes that had never been properly curated. Um, and they had been around for about 20 years. And due to issues with archival processing and some custodial questions, uh, we decided to use this as an opportunity to tackle this small um, set of, of data on this obsolete format. I should mention that seven, the seven track tape magnetic format, recording format, was the industry standard for over 20 years. Um, it was first introduced in 1952 and was used throughout the government and by computer centers across around the world for, for that period. So there, are, there were th records in three series that we identified. Um, and so it came to my attention that we needed to finally take care of these. Google is a wonderful thing. If you Google seven track tape data recovery, um, you'll come up with a small set of vendors uh, and one federal sister organization called the CENT, referred to as the National Center for Atmospheric Research that continue to have the capability to read tapes in this format. Uh, the National Archives did have this capability into the late 90s, um, but as with any obsolete recording format, the vendors who, who have the capability of reading them become smaller and smaller over time. So we partnered with uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, and with our sister archives in Denver, Colorado, who handled the on-the-ground logistics. Um, from, so we shipped the 13 tapes to Denver. They interfaced with the NCAR in Boulder. Uh, and NCAR was able to successfully recover data from nine of the 13 tapes. Uh, turned out that four of the tapes were, were blank. We had no idea that that was the case until, until these were read. So another unique characteristic for uh, the seven track recording format is that the data, the data is recorded in a character set referred to as BCD or binary coded decimal which is uh, which relates to to how the data is recorded on the tape. So not only did the data have to be recovered, but it needed to be converted uh, from the binary coded decimal to a more modern uh, universal character set referred to as ASCII. So NCAR did a terrific job. They recovered the data. Not only, not only did they recover all the data from the nine tapes that had data, but they did, the they did the recovery and the conversion for us and allowed us to just uh, download the resultant files from their FTP site. Uh, they've been properly preserved and migrated to the Electronic Records Archives. And we've actually had a number of researcher inquiries about them. Uh, so all in all, it was a very successful project. And I was very happy to, to see these records finally curated in the, in the appropriate way. So thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Ted. Um, before we uh, wrap up here, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the reports that OCLC Research has been producing that, to offer advice on managing foreign digital resources. Um, I'm, Melissa, can you catch us up on slides or give me the ball? Sure, you should be getting the ball right now, Ricky. Sorry, Got it. there's a little glitch. There you go. So the first report uh, offers advice for inventorying what you have and beginning to prioritize it. Uh, the second one, called Walk This Way, gives a lot of advice and tips and tools for dealing with, with media that you can read in-house. Swatting the Long Tail suggests a collaborative approach to media and formats you can't read in-house, as we've been talking about today. And then there's the new report that's already been mentioned. This was um, published in August and co-authored with Ben and Matthew. It suggests the things to consider when you're working with someone else to transfer your content to a form you can manage. 
This outline gives you an idea of what's covered in the document. It, it doesn't tell you what to say in each category, but it prompts you to consider if each is relevant to your situation and then what aspects might be addressed, while encouraging adherence to both archival principles and technical requirements. It's a checklist that helps you think of all the issues up front so that your project goes as smoothly as possible. So let's go ahead to the um, questions. We've had uh, several on chat and one on Twitter. One of them, the one that came through Twitter seemed um, maybe perfect for Matthew, which was um, about training for, is it easier to train, oh, I lost it, to, easier to train an IT person to be sensitive to archival issues or is it easier to start with an archivist and train them in tech? Um, um, yeah, and I, I which can, is better and can, yeah, okay. Go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, I can uh, sort of briefly answer that. Um, I think I'll start with sort of the last question is can we always get both? I think that's, <laughs> that's the important part is you need to kind of identify whether it's someone in IT or someone in archives who has the interest in and sort of where these two fields intersect and has the interest in digital archives. And um, I mean, I could say for myself, uh, I was trained in the archival concepts and then sort of picked up on kind of how they map to IT concepts. Um, but I mean, it could work perfectly well the other way. Uh, to me, almost the ideal candidate, again, if we're just sort of um, looking at like a perfect world scenario, is someone who has a computer science undergrad degree and then an MLIS graduate degree, which it hasn't traditionally been the path, but I think we're seeing more and more people who are sort of, sort of doing that as as MLIS degrees become more sort of tech-centric in, in many ways. Um, but yeah, anyways, I think the important part is to identify sort of the interest and then try to cultivate that interest, whether it's someone, a student or an archivist or anyone working in, in the archives who seems interested in that in, in those sorts of things, um, you know, uh, SAA provides class on, on, on or provides uh, their sort of training track on getting a digital archives certification. And a lot of those classes are good for teaching. Uh, and then likewise, for probably for an IT person, those classes will be good too, because it's it's sort of a a, um, a roadmap to how these two fields intersect. So I guess that's my <laughs> relatively short answer. Thanks. Um, ben, I wondered if you might uh, take the question about uh, what do you do about viruses, sensitive information, or duplicates? Obviously, you don't have to limit it to the um, project you talked about today, but just in general, could you say something brief about those three topics? Yeah, well, those are three uh, very different topics in a way. Um, <laughs> well, um, I think all of those sort of fixate on the idea that we need better tools for doing appraisal, perhaps. Um, and I think I think we're really good about inventorying the media and taking some steps to transfer it off of the fixed media. We've done a lot in the field recently to sort of get everyone moving and behind that that notion. Um, but I think we still have some ways to go to to do appraisal. Um, I, there's some I mentioned uh, Bit Curator and FTK Imager. Those are two uh, forensics tools that can help with some aspects of appraisal. Uh, there's lots of other open source tools um, that can do little aspects of of certain ones, um, certain certain concerns like just viruses, and so um, I mean I would encourage people to uh, look into those tools and get some comfort with them and install them locally if they can and, and try to test them out. Um, as for what we do, um, <laughs> we try to appraise what we can. Uh, we we have everything sort of wrapped up in a dark archive, so I'm sort of anticipating I think a question that Mary Lee posted here too um, about going beyond inventory. Um, we're still in the in the process of program building, so I think we're just trying to isolate those those you know sensitive data, isolate viruses if we see them, um, note them for ourselves, and as our program evolves, I think we'll our our solutions and our strategies will become more complex and be able to do more. Marina Adelot from Library of Congress here. Just wanted to assure people. I mean, your mileage may vary, but in the processing of tens and tens of thousands of published and unpublished CDs and DVDs from all over the world, we've encountered one virus. So I'm not saying that everyone else will have this experience, but that, um, you know, 
I think that, um, you know, being able to quickly evaluate items, isolate items that um, have these kinds of, like these kinds of issues, um, just right from the get-go, um, it wasn't as intimidating as we thought it was going to be. Thanks. I think Merrilee's question about um, going beyond inventory and, and assessing how likely researchers are to request materials reminds me of the, the very first question we got when we did a similar panel to this at, at the SAA conference. The first question we got was, just because we can, should we? Are heroic efforts worth the resources? And I think that's a, that's a really interesting um, question to start thinking about how likely researchers are to request material. Um, is that one you'd like to address, Elise, or anyone else? Um, I, I can try to. In our case, it, it was really an issue that we had already identified that this material was going to be important. Um, it was so far in the future that, honestly, if it wasn't such a prime figure within our institution, I'm not sure we would have gone through the effort. We have a lot of media that we choose not to convert because it's it's sort of it's sort of the batch of uh, congregations just sending us their preacher sermons that that just aren't worth even take you know they're they're not worth taking that extra step to make something make sure that it's useful we we decide what level it is that we want to preserve it as do we want to make sure that the bits will be here or do we want to ensure that it's going to be readable um, and and we've sort of come up with a matrix within our institution as to how we make that decision thanks anyone else want to address that question There was a, an additional question about sustainability. Um, how do we go beyond soft money sources for pilot programs to get support for activities on a broader scale? Anyone want to address that? I think um, you know one of the things to consider is that these, in fact, are the archives of our day. So, you know, funding that was paying for taking in collections in the past should, you know, accommodate collections of the future. I mean, it should come out of base funds. Someone, um, you know, noted the other day that for there's you know the forty dollars uh, per disc per transfer that we came up with uh, during the um, pilot testing, some people respond to that and go, oh my god, it's so expensive, and other people say, oh my god, that's amazingly re reasonable. So, you know, it, it all depends, I guess, on the size of your budget and the size of the number of things that you have to transfer. But $40 an item is roughly, I think, what people pay for video or audio transfer. You know, it's, it's not that, like, crazy different. So we ought to be thinking about this as a mainstream activity and making sure that we get it covered by base funding. And of course, as is often the case, that might mean you're not doing something else, which is why it's so important to make those distinctions is, you know, do your inventory, but just because you have it doesn't mean it's worth the heroic efforts. Let's think about what's the likelihood that someone's going to need this material, just as we would with any other archival material. Perhaps that's a good note to end on. Um, Melissa, do you want to do a little housekeeping wrap-up? And thank you all for attending.